All right, so we're continue on with classes ad infinitum this quarter. So uh, we we created our item class to try to replicate this from last quarter. Uh, remember, we had our unique ID and stuff like that. So we created this class yesterday, and we initialized it with two things, and we let the class itself create its own ID. So this is really like a database. This class becomes a representation of a single record in the database. And if you were to create a new record in the database with an auto increment field, it would create the, the ID for you, right? So we're letting the class do that for us. Uh, and we'll deal with a random uniqueness later. Or an auto increment, maybe we'll do that one too. Uh, but the one thing I didn't have in here, I created these methods for adding and removing elements in the my size array, but I don't have any way of changing the description. If there's if I want to just change the price, I want to go through and and I have a price increase, I want to up the price of my shirt, how would I do that? There's no way to get at the price data unless I delete the item and create a brand new one through the initialization process, right? So I need to have some way of setting that price after the item has already been created. And I might want to look at the item's price by itself rather than getting this whole 2S description. So that implies that I need getters and setters for each of the attributes that I want to have available to the outside world. All right. So let's, uh, let's write those. Uh, how would we write a get uh, a getter for my description? Let's start with that one. Def. All right, we're going to define a new method, and we'll call it. It's it's easiest if I call it the same name as what I have in the method, but I don't have to. I can call it whatever I want, but it makes sense uh, that the description method is different than the instance variable method. And to the outside world, I'll just be calling item.description, and this will return whatever I want it to return. And in this case, what do I want to return? At description. I just want to give to the outside world, I want to be able to get at this data. And w at whatever state it's at right now, when I call this, I'm going to get that data out of this data structure. All right? so. Any questions on that? So that's a that's a getter because it gets the value from the class. You do not need the return, and and why is that? It's the only thing in there, uh, and a method in Ruby returns by default the last statement in the method, the last statement in the method. So this is redundant, but I like them there just because that makes sure you know what's happening. I'm returning this description. But you'll see a lot of code out there that they don't do that. All right, then we have, uh, we need a, a setter. So a setter is unique in that I, I'm wanting to change the value inside the class. So we can call it the same name again, except with one exception. We have to add an equal sign at the end of it. So the equal sign you can think of it as becoming part of the name of the method. All right, so I want to call description equals, and then I want to pass in something. So this is the something that I'm going to assign to it. And I can call this whatever I want as well, but I might as well call it description. That's just a local uh, parameter name, and I need to take that value and stuff it where? Very good, in the instance variable called description. So all I have to do is call at description equals description. All right, so now I have a, this is a, this is a uh, getter, and this is a setter. All right, getter and a setter for the description. Now I need to do the same thing for my price if I want to have that available. I don't have to do that. And that's the concept of encapsulation, which your web research is 
talking about uh, hiding some information. I might not want to expose this information to the outside world. In this case, it makes sense, so I'm going to do the price. Uh, we'll call it price, and we're going to return the instance variable of where I'm storing that price. And so by the end of this assignment, you should be able to write these in your sleep. All right, so same, same pattern. This is just a nice pattern that's happening. Whatever this, the name of my instance variable is, I'm going to write two methods, one for a getter, one for a setter. And there are cases when I might only want a getter. And there are cases when I only want a setter. There, there are cases where that's important if, when you're programming these as you get more advanced on this, these classes. All right, so uh, how about the ID? Do I want to be able to get that? This maybe, maybe not. I mean, that might be one that uh, I don't. I don't have to, I'm never going to set it because the database, I never can set an ID in a row. It's always set by the database. So I might want to get it though, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to get the data. I might write a, a getter for it. And we're going to return whatever ID is. But I'm never going to want to set this value. I'm going to let the database or my class set that value. So I'm never going to write a getter uh, setter for this. Okay, does everybody understand that differentiation now? That's a one reason why I wouldn't have that as a specific one. All right. So now to test all of that, I I would do. I have a pants and a shirt, so I could say puts shirt dot. I mean shirt dot description. Descript and I can say puts shirt dot um, price and that's what I call exercising that method so if I print this out and it prints out what I expect it to print out then that's a good uh, a good method why is my Oh, that it came up from that auto insert thing from RubyMine. Thank you, RubyMine. Yep. All right. So, good catch. So it printed out shirt, and I got it didn't print out anything. Anybody see the problem? Ah, so it's returning something that isn't in my class. So Ruby is fine with that. It actually created this instance variable at the time it accessed it, but it's nil, so it's nothing there. So good point. So we'll take that out. I did that on purpose to show you that. So now I've got shirt and pr my price. So that works. Um, now I want to be able to change the value, so I want to call the, the uh, setters for the shirt and the price. So down here, I'm going to change some values change values and I'm going to say shirt dot description equals and then whatever the value is. Uh, so I'm going to change my shirt to Hawaiian Ho Hawaiian I don't know how to spell Hawaiian <laughs> Hawaiian there we go shirt all right and I want to change my price since it's Hawaiian. It's got to be more expensive, so it's going to be uh, 69.99. Yeah, That's going to be the price. Thank you. So you don't pass out, like no, you don't. But this is this is uh, you can do that. That actually is you can do this if you want. Um, it's the same thing. But do you normally write? Equal signs like that? Not normally. So uh, that that setter 
makes it look exactly like a normal expression. I'm taking this value. That gets passed into my setter, my price setter, into this variable. That variable then gets assigned into my at instance variable of price. It's not really. It's a short, when I define it, it has to be right next to it, but when I use it, it does not. Okay, so this that's because we want this to look like a normal expression. Is it messed up? <laughs> it's different. It is different. That's the way because in Ruby, the equal sign is actually a method, and the plus sign is actually a method. It's a, it's a very bizarre thing. So. Don't put too much thought into it. Just build them like this. You've got to have the equal sign right next to the, the name. Here you do. When you define it, do it like that. Right. If I want to make this, if I want to make this a setter, that's how I have to define it. You don't think so? All right. Well, let's see. Well, let's see. So let's print these out again. Wrong number of arguments, zero for one. So it works for you, maybe, if you, if you did this. It no longer becomes an assignment method. It becomes a method like that. All right, that will work. Well, it should. Zero for one price. It shouldn't. Right. Yeah, see, we have two methods now that are called the same thing. One takes a variable, one doesn't. And we can't do that in, in Ruby. C++, you can do that. Some, some places... Right, it's an overloading issue that Ruby doesn't do this, doesn't allow that. So that's why we need a different method name, and that causes it now to be a different method name. Now let's see if this works. I don't think this will either, because now there's no method called price equals. So you have to just do it this way and be happy with it. <laughs> do like I say, and that's it. So. That, that's why it doesn't overload exactly like C sharp and C++. Uh, that's why we have this separate price equals name. All right, accept it. Just accept it. So now we're back to working again. All right. So now my Hawaiian shirt. If I were to print out my, uh, just call my shirt, which calls what method? If I just print out, puts my shirt. It calls the 2S method because that's the default conversion of my method. So I get this is its item number, Hawaiian shirt, price, and the sizes that I have associated with it. Huh? Nobody in here, right? Probably not. Not after eating all these maple bars, that's for sure. All right, any questions on that? Not complaints, just questions. <laughs> David. <laughs> All right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just want to make it as hard as possible for you. All right. So. <laughs> yeah, it's not. It's not C sharp. It's not C sharp. It doesn't do that overloading like that. Okay. So, um, how about a. A, uh, a, a setter for our size. How are we adding stuff to the size? Now, this is what we talked about yesterday. There should, I would never allow you to have a setter for an array like this. Why is that? 
Right, exactly. It exposes the outside world that it is in fact an array, and that ties now the class to the outside implementation. So if, if I want to change this in the future to using a hash, all of the outside code that utilizes this then has to change as well. And that's a bad programming paradigm. So I would never want them to know it's an array. So that's why I wrote setters by adding this add size and the remove size. Those are basically setters, both of them. They're changing the value inside the class. But I might want to say, what are all the sizes available for this shirt? And that would be implied as what type? Would it be a setter or a getter? A getter. OK, so I want to get the values from, the, uh, from this shirt. Now, this is an implementation issue. Uh, how might I want to expose the size to the outside world? What would the outside world call useful if I wanted to get all the sizes from this? Return what? Well, a string? A string is a possibility? Well, you might have to, you'd have to iterate through the hat or through the array. Okay, but what type of data do we want to allow the outside world to see? Well, we already have that with our 2S. I mean, this is already doing that. It's calling the join. But I don't want all this stuff. I just want to see. For this shirt, I want to see all the prices. So I mean, all the sizes. So I want to do something dot something and return what? That's going to get me all the sizes, right? Give me something dot sizes, all right? What type of data do I want back, though? OK, that's a possibility. That's one possibility. What would be the most useful to the outside world? When you're programming again, this is programming. When, when you're writing classes, you're talking about another programmer using this data structure. You're not talking about the user. Okay, we're talking about who's going to use my item class. Well, it's another programmer. They they want to get at this data and build the interface to the outside world, and they might show it as a string. But if they have a bunch of sizes, an integer for sizes. There you go. Thank you. I want a bunch of things together, a collection of the sizes. So why not expose it as an array? That does not matter how I have it inside the class, though. I could have it in the class as a hash or a back-end database row. But what I expose to the world is going to be an array. That makes sense, right? Right. I think so. Anytime there's more than one of something, I want to return the array. So this, I want to have this uh, return an array. Now internally, how am I storing my sizes? Well, it just happens to be an array. But again, internally, that could be com something completely different. That could be a database access. That could be something else. And this class would have to get all the data and convert it into an array to expose it to the outside world. So. In this case, this, this makes it easy. I'm going to write my, my getter for my size. I'll call it sizes. And all I want to return is my sizes array, which already is an array. And that just happens to be perfect. So if I put this out and call that inspect on it so I can see that it's an array, I get nothing because my shirt had no nothing in it. Why is that? It's probably I named my thing wrong. The, I called this size, and I want to return size. So plurality is very important. So when I inspect it, I did that just to show that it's an array. It prints it out as an array. And I can see I have one value in my, my shirt sizes. All right, so then, given that, I could go through, um, let's take out my remove so I have more than one to play with. And now I have a large and a small size. So now, what is this value? What type of data is shirt.sizes? It's an array, OK? So I can do array type stuff with it, right? 
I can say shirt dot sizes do not do double. I can do my pipe and what is going to be inside my go pulse size a singular version of my sizes because that's a collection of a bunch of them. No. Well, I would change that. If you really want, this should be sizes, right? All right, fine, fine, fine. This should be sizes. Uh, remove a single size. That's okay. Return sizes. This is sizes. Done. There you go. Is that better? That makes you happy. And I missed one, I'm sure. Uh, I missed one. These are, I'm adding one size at a time, so those make sense, right? All right, so I can do single size, and I can say puts uh, size, something like that, and it prints. So I messed it up somehow with my sizes is right. Shirt dot sizes do. You broke it. I broke it. Let me think. Let me think for a minute. Ah, thank you. I have to call the each method because this is an array, right? That's an array. I want to call each method on it. There we go. Thank you. All right, so I get, and I can iterate through my collection of sizes. So from a programmer's point of view of using my item class, an array makes sense in this case. But again, that's completely different than what I implement inside of my class. That could be something completely different. Okay, any other, any questions on that? So we've got a nice little set up here, um, and I want to show you a shortcut for some of these things, um, but you're not allowed to use them for next Wednesday's assignment. Okay, after next Wednesday you can use them, but for this one you have to write all ten methods or whatever, all the, the getters and all the setters. Do not use this method. All right, everybody got that? <laughs> All right. So there are some shortcuts uh, that we can add to our class because this is so common. I'm, I have this structure. I have a getter and a setter for an instance variable. And an instance variable happens to be the same name that I want to call my getter and my setter, right? So this can all be created programmatically. And somebody thought that up early on and said, hey, I could write all this for you. Why do you have to keep writing all this code for yourself? Uh, let Ruby do it for you. If you're going to name something uh, the same as the getter and the setter and the instance variable, if those are all going to be the same name, then I can change this and use a method to create this, in, this stuff for me. And it's called Atra Accessor. All right, so atra accessor is a method. See that? It is a method, and I'm going to pass it some arguments. So uh, when I pass it an argument, it will take that argument and actually, during runtime, write these methods for me. It's going to write and define these, these methods for me automatically. Isn't that cool? Uh, and that's the dynamic nature of Ruby. You cannot do that in C Sharp. You can't write code dynamically easily. I mean, you, they have an eval statement and things, but it does. It won't create methods for you on the fly. And that's the nice thing about Rails. If I add something new to Rails, it generates these methods for me automatically, and I don't have to, I don't have to do anything. There's a lot of magic that goes on behind the scenes, and this is one of these magic pieces, okay? So to tell it that I want to have a getter and a setter and an instance variable, it's going to create three things for me. 
I give it the symbol name, which starts with a, a colon, of the name of the instance variable, the getter, and the setter. So if I want to call this description, that will create not only an instance variable, but it will create these two methods for me. So I can delete these completely, and my program should run exactly the same. Look at that. No problem. I can still do uh, shirt.description. It created that method for me. It created the shirt.description equals method. So I have a getter and a setter. So what's the purpose of the first method? There are some times when you want to make your, your getter do something else. At this point, I can't get at the code. Okay, I can't look at this method. It's, it wrote it just like... Uh, it wrote it like that. But there might be a case where um, I need to do something else to get some data. I might have, you know, do something else here before I return the description. Maybe I'm calculating something, something else, right? So I, I wouldn't be able to use that automatic method creator. Only can I use it if this is the structure that I want. I'm only going to return... The, the instance variable, or I'm only going to set the instance variable. So the That's it. Assessor method, after assessor method, does both the get and the set. Yes. And it creates the instance variable. Is there a way to do just the get or just the set? Yes, there is. Yes. Way ahead of me. There is. Uh, since you asked that question, there is a way to do just a getter or just a setter. And those are the Atra reader. What do you think that one creates? A getter. So I could say description. Or an Atra writer, which is, what do you think that is? That's my setter. So that's the same thing as doing this, one line. Oops. Oh, that's cool. These two make up this line. So I can alternatively only allow a reader and not create a writer for a variable if I wanted to do that. Right? So there are some cases like the ID. I only want to get the ID. So I wouldn't put this as, in a, as an after accessor, right? I would put it as a, a reader, right? So for my reader, I want to change this to an ID. Let's take this out, put my description back in. And now I can delete this uh, getter for my ID. That, that creates a symbol. A symbol is a, a thing. We talked a little bit about it last quarter, but not much. Uh, these are used very heavily now in Rails. It's a way of creating, you could think of it as a constant string that you can't change. It's not the name of something, it's a thing. And you see actually in the documentation, they call it a thing. That because it, it's not really a string, it's it's a symbol that creates a symbol. All right. So in a symbol in IRB, I can do this. I can say a equals a symbol of Dave. All right. So when I look at it, it is a symbol, and I can do things like does a equal Dave. It's true. It's a constant. You think of it like a constant string. Okay. A constant string. It's like a, a, a constant that you define in your code. It will always be Dave. And there's no value associated with it other than its name. And the fact that it exists. And it exists. It exists and it has a name. Now, the nice thing is I can take a, 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 a symbol and I can convert it to a string. So the A can be converted to a string and I can use that in different things. So a symbol has a string representation, or I can take a string and I can, can um, convert it to a symbol. So Rails does that automatically a lot, converting strings to symbols and symbols to strings. But that's all it is. Don't, there's not a lot to a symbol other than it is a thing that has a name and that it exists. So it's a constant string is the way I like to think of it. You can't change it. 
I can't change symbol Dave to be symbol Dave Jones. It does, does, I'd have to create a whole new symbol for that. You're not, you're not having trouble with that one. You're having trouble with that one. Um, well, well, we'll use them, and you'll see a little bit how, how we use them. So this, this creates a symbol on the fly by putting a colon in front of it. All right, this creates a symbol on the fly by creating it, a colon in front of it. So this method, after reader, uses this symbol, converts it to a string, creates an instance variable, creates a getter, creates a setter. Or not that one, only creates a getter in that case, right? It creates an instance variable called at ID. It creates a, a reader called ID. Okay, the at accessor creates an instance variable called description at description, creates a, a getter called dot description, and a setter called description equals. So it does all three things in the after accessor case. So I can get rid of my ID completely. Uh, my price is identical. That's a standard getter and a setter. So I can delete my price and add that to the list up here. So I can just pass a list of all of these things that I want to have getters and setters for in the after accessor piece. Uh, and the rest are uh, special, okay? They're, they're doing something different. So I've shrunk my, my class down significantly by having this one line of code here. And my code runs identically because these methods created as I ran it, dynamically created these methods for me. And that's a little too advanced to show you how they actually do that, but that's, that's some advanced Ruby to what it actually does. But it's pretty cool. That's one thing nice about Ruby. I can change things dynamically on the fly. But what's the answer? It's, uh, yeah. The answer is in your head or in Google, one or the other. All right, so this is the kind of code that I want you to write for your classes just to test it. I'm going to try, if I have time, to write you an automatic tester for your code. I think that would be a good introduction to testing as well. So there you go. Have fun. At this point, you know enough to create your next assignment. And it shouldn't take you more than an hour to do the whole thing. So.